In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance family this morning. And as always, especially today, let us start off our day with the Blessed Mother. Let's call upon Mary. There are many titles we can give to Mary. One is Mary is the Mother of God, the greatest title. Mary is the mother of the church. And also, Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And we have to say that Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Let's turn to Mary and ask her to pray for us, to be with us, to help us, to love Christ all the more. As we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We would not presume to start our class without asking our spiritual guide to be with us. And our spiritual guide is... God himself. This is the Holy Spirit. Among the many titles that are given to the Holy Spirit are the following. He is the paraclete. He is the sanctifier. He's also the consoler. He's also the Counselor. He's also known as the gift of gifts. And also the Holy Spirit is known as the interior master. Because as St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means daddy or father. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we invite him to be with us in, in the very simple song that I sing in honor of the Holy Spirit every morning with you. And it's this. Spirit of the living God, all afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Now in us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Melt us. Mold us. Fill us. Use us. Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. <clears throat> Fall afresh on us. Oh, Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. 
Saint Raphael. Pray for us. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, my friends, a couple of you have mentioned the feast day of Saint Paul, uh, Saint Paul the Hermit. We'll mention him a little bit later on. But uh, today, being Saturday, is a day in which I invite all of us to renew our devotion to Mary. Saturday is the day of the week in which we honor Mary in a very special way. When I celebrate my Mass later on, I'll be celebrating the vote of Mass in honor of Mary. I invite all of you to pray for me because actually today, I'm actually, after this talk, most of today I'll be, I'm going to be giving a retreat to the all the Legion of Mary in Southern California, uh, going up to San Francisco, and even some of those who are in the Legion of Mary in, in uh, Arizona. So I ask you to uh, pray for me and pray for our retreat. And pray for the legionaries, the legion, the legion of Mary. Maybe some of you uh, have been in the Legion of Mary. Maybe you're, you've been a member. Maybe you pray the Tessera. But the purpose of this group is to bring the love of Christ to the world through Mary. Legion of Mary basically means the soldiers of Mary. So I ask for your prayers. And so today I'd like to encourage you to grow in your your devotion to Mary. And I'd like to suggest something I mentioned about six months ago, and I'd like to just reiterate this. And it's the following. Probably most of you have not finished it, but I would encourage you all in time to read this Marian classic. This Marian classic written by St. Alphonse de Liguri is The Glories of Mary. Okay, the, the Glories of Mary. This is one of the greatest spiritual masterpieces written on Mary in the history of the church. This classic written by St. Alphonsus, of all of his writings, this is considered to be his greatest, The Glories of Mary. Now, what is this Glories of Mary? St. Alphonsus took the prayer, the Hail Holy Queen, and he took it a word at a time. And he explains it in minute detail. For example, hail and holy and queen. What he does is he goes to the Bible, taking out these words from the hail, holy queen, and going to biblical roots, explaining it. Then he goes to the fathers of the church. Then he goes to the saints up until the time that he lived in the 18th and 19th century. So he explains that beautiful prayer we say at the end of the rosary, the Hail Holy Queen. Then, after he explains it, he tells a little story. Because the art of good preaching and teaching is storytelling knowing what story to tell, how to tell it, and how to insert it in your message. Now, I'll just give you one, one of the charming stories. <clears throat> he speaks about 
a whale and the little baby whales. And he mentions that when a predator comes, flows to the baby whales, what he will do, rather what the mother whale will do, she'll, seeing the danger, she opens up her mouth, the mother whale, and she sucks the baby whales inside her mouth. And she keeps there until the predator, which might be a shark or another vicious fish, is on the prowl. And once the danger is over, then the mother whale will spit out the little fish into the water because the danger has has been conquered. And St. Alfonso used that story to say that we are in moral danger in our spiritual lives. Moral danger and other types of danger. And as the little baby fish sought refuge in the mouth of the mother well, so we're called to seek refuge under the mantle of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So this is the Glories of Mary, written by St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori. And the translation is very well done. <clears throat> the translation of this masterpiece will be done by Dennis Billy, a redemptorist priest who studied with my brother Mike at Dartmouth in the 70s, and he went on to become a, a redemptorist priest. And he's working on translating a lot of the works of St. Alphonsus from the Italian into into the English. So in honor of Mary, and Saturday is the day of Mary, let's try to get to know and love Mary by reading on Mary. And here's that spiritual masterpiece, The Glories of Mary, written by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Okay. I'm going to uh, read a verse from the first reading today. And as you probably know that we're going through the letter of letter to the Hebrews and we've arrived at the second chapter of St. Mark. The letter of the Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 speaks about the Bible. It speaks about the Bible. And speaks about actually what the Bible does, the power of the Bible. It says, the word of God is living and effective. Okay, we meditate upon the word of God. The word of God is living and effective. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Penetrating even between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. So the Word of God is, is saying to us that the Word of God is very powerful. Very, very powerful. Very powerful. So, a couple of you mentioned on online the the saint that we celebrate. It's not a universal saint, but Saint Paul the Hermit, who lived to be a hundred and twelve years of age, and basically went off the last sixty years of his life. He lived in a cave to pray, to fast, to meditate in silence, and he would have a raven that would bring him food every day, a bird that would drop food for him. And who was impressed by 
Saint Paul the Hermit is the saint that we celebrate tomorrow. And given that tomorrow is Sunday, we won't be celebrating him formally because Sunday always prevails over over the uh, the saints. With that saint tomorrow is Saint Anthony of the Desert. Saint Anthony of the Desert was very impressed by Paul the Hermit. So related to the first reading, the Word of God living and effective. Try to remember that the Word of God, the Word of God is living and effective. Living and effective. I'd like you tell tell you the story of Saint Anthony was impressed by Saint Paul the Hermit, but Saint Anthony went through a conversion, you might say, by the Word of God. And if you like, you can read the life of Saint Anthony of the Desert, written by Saint Athanasius. Remember when I was in the university, my professor allowed me to do a tutorial, and one was on St. Anthony of the Desert, written by St. Athanasius, and it was fascinating. St. Paul lived to be 112. St. Anthony lived into his 100s. They basically, bread and water, or something very simple. So the word of God is living and effective. So here's the story in the life of St. Anthony of the Desert. Not to be confused with St. Anthony of Padua. Related to the word of God is living and effective. <clears throat> Anthony was brought up and raised in Egypt. And he had wealthy parents. And what happened was his parents died when he was uh, young, about, they say about 18 years of age. Leaving Anthony with his little sister and they left him huge plots of land. Now back then, talking about 1700 years ago wealth was not measured simply by cash but rather by land and animals and houses that's how wealth was measured so anthony was left his parents left him a huge inheritance Anthony was a Christian Catholic, and a good one, and a prayerful one. This is what happened. One day, this is how God works, Anthony was heading off to church. And in church, He heard the Word of God, the Word of God, which is effective and powerful. And this was the, the gospel that he heard. He said, he heard the words of Jesus. If you want to be perfect, go sell all you have and give to the poor, and you'll have riches in heaven. So Anthony took this literally, and he went, and he sold all of his property. And with the money that was given to him, he went and he gave the money to the poor. So he followed the word of God, which is 
living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword that cut right through Anthony and his material possessions. You see how detached he was. So he sold his property, gave the money to the poor. However, he held on to a little bit. And the reason why he held on to a little bit was a very good motive, very good intention. The reason being is that he had a little sister and he was thinking, what am I going to do with my little sister if I don't have any money? So he was thinking, what am I going to do? So we held on to a little bit of money, possessions, held on at least to a, to a little bit. But then he went to church the following day and what happened was he heard the word of God as such. Do not worry about tomorrow. Because Anthony was worrying, and it's a good type of worry in the sense that he was thinking, what am I going to do with my sister? Do not worry about tomorrow. So he went and he sold everything. And back then, we're talking about the 300s earlier There was a group of women called virgins that would not get married and dedicate themselves to prayer and penance and helping out widows and orphans. So Anthony placed his little sister in the care of these virgins, this group. Then Anthony went off, he went off to the desert like Paul the hermit, and he dedicated himself to prayer, penance, and fasting. And Anthony of the Desert is pretty famous also <clears throat> for his struggles against the devil. If you ever seen a picture of St. Anthony of the Desert, there are different depictions. But one is he's got all these devils hanging on him, on his ear, on his nose. And these devils are trying to tempt Anthony. So I'd like to tell you one more story in the life of St. Anthony, who was very impressed by Paul the Hermit. And the Anthony Desert will go on to be the founder of Eastern monasticism, where St. Benedict will be go on, go on to be the founder of Western monasticism. So you've got Eastern monasticism, Anthony the Desert, and Western monasticism, St. Benedict of Nursia. So here's the story. And I think this story can encourage us. It's powerful story. This you can read in the life of St. Anthony writ written by St. Athanasius, father and doctor of the church. Anthony was in the desert all by himself and he was praying. He was praying. And out of the blue, the devil comes, the devil comes to tempt Anthony. And the temptation of the devil is very insistent. And this temptation was against the virtue of chastity. 
Anthony had never married, he didn't have a girlfriend, and he didn't have TV, the internet, the phone, the images the way we have it today. He lived a very simple, holy life, but the devil of impurity was attacking him. And Anthony was rebuffing this, rejecting it. But the temptation went on and on. The temptation went on and on. And Anthony kept fighting off the temptation. And you know how long this temptation lasted? This is not to scare any of you, but just to be recognized that our spiritual life is spiritual warfare. It really is. We are in spiritual warfare. This temptation, my friends, lasted a full year. Finally, after the year had transpired, and he was tempted the whole time, <clears throat> Jesus spoke to Anthony, and Anthony said to the Lord, 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 where were you during the whole time of this temptation? And Jesus said, I was in the very depths of your heart. I was in the very depths of your heart. This is a very good story because all of us are tempted in one way or another. But a temptation is not a sin until we give in to the temptation. I repeat, the temptation is not a sin until we get it, give in to the temptation. Maybe you heard the story of a man that was talking to the priest. The priest asked him, Did you entertain bad thoughts, sir? He said, no, they entertain me. Got it? Sir, did you entertain bad thoughts? No, they entertain me. That would be a sin. But as soon as we're aware of temptations coming at us, like St. Anthony, we have to be strong to reject these temptations from the very outset. Soon as they come, name it, claim it, and tame it. Yep. Name it, claim it, and tame it. Name it, it's a temptation. Claim it through the precious blood of Christ. And then name it, claim it, and tame it. Get rid of it. So St. Anthony was able to reject that temptation, and he, he's a patron of those who are tempted. And St. Anthony is actually called, he's called forth in the exorcisms. We Pray to Jesus, Mary, St. Michael, St. Joseph, and St. Anthony, and St. Benedict as powerful intercessors against the attack of the devil. Now, one last idea. Why would God allow St. Anthony to have that temptation and St. Alphonsus, when he was about 90, had temptations against against chastity also. Why would God allow this man in the desert to be tempted, you know, far away from the the bars and the the bad uh, environments? Why why would God allow that? 
why would God allow St. Alfonso Liguori, who lived a very holy life, bent over with arthritis, almost blind and deaf at the end of his life, St. Alfonso? Why would God allow that? Well, various reasons. Number one, so that they would pray all the more. Number two, because God knew that they were strong and they could overcome the temptation. Number three, to help them to grow in humility. Number four, as a lesson for us that we are in spiritual combat. And number five, so that Anthony and St. Alphonsus, <clears throat> not only would they go to heaven, but they would have a higher place in heaven. That's the reason. That's the reason for God allowing these powerful temptations to assault us. God allows evil to bring greater good out of evil. All right. The responsorial psalm is from Psalm 19. The antiphon is, your words, Lord, are spirit and life. Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. What can we say about the responsorial psalm? Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. Is that one of the messages is this, is that we should have a real hunger for the Word of God. Remember when Jesus was being tempted in the desert during, for 40 days and 40 nights? Remember, it's the gospel for the first Sunday in Lent. The version of Matthew has Jesus tempted three times. In the first temptation of Jesus is the devil recognizing that Jesus is hungry. <clears throat> he approaches Jesus and says, if you're really the son of God, why don't you turn those stones into bread? And Jesus responds, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Jesus is teaching us Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. Is that in our composite makeup as a human person that has both body and soul, our body is important. But our mind, our heart, and soul are much more noble and much more important. Jesus is showing us the priorities. What is more noble, your mind or your stomach? The purpose of your stomach, and this is the God-given purpose of your stomach, is to dig digest food so that you'll have energy and calories to be able to carry out your obligation. But what about the mind? The purpose of the mind is to absorb the truth. <clears throat> and Jesus says the truth will set you free. For that reason, Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, he gives us a principle and foundation in his own words, speaking about the three greatest longings of the human person. 
Every human person has three great desires or longings. We have a great longing, yearning desire to know, to love, and to live. I repeat, the three longings of the human person, to know, to love, and to live. To know the truth. And the truth is presented in the Word of God. And the purpose of the mind is to absorb the truth. To love. To love God and to let God love us. And the human person has a desire to live. We have to be born three times. We're born biologically. We're born in the moment of our baptism. And we are born when we die physically, because when we die physically, we're born into heaven. That's why the church teaches that the death of the saints is their birthday into heaven. So if we have known God in this life, if we have loved God in this life, then our death is the gateway to heaven. It's the portal to eternity in which we're going to be united to the triune God and contemplate the beatific vision for all eternity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So today, in honor of the first reading, the Word of God is living and effective. The responsorial psalm, Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. Let us pray for the grace to have a real longing, a real yearning to make our holy hour. Yes, because by making our holy hour, we're spending time, my friends, we're spending time, my friends, with the Word of God. <clears throat> And remember the words of St. Jerome, father of the church that translated the Bible from Greek and Aramaic into Latin, into the vernacular, so that we can read the Bible in our own language. St. Jerome is quoted in Vatican II in the dogmatic constitution, De Verbum, which means the word of God. In these words, ignorance of sacred scripture is ignorance of Christ. A man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And Mary teaches us, Mary teaches us twice in the Gospel of St. Luke, Luke chapter 2 mentions that Mary, after the visit of the shepherds, Mary pondered in her heart the meaning of those events. Mary can help us to meditate upon the Word of God more efficaciously. And later on in the same chapter, when Jesus is 12 years of age and he's lost and found after three days of sorrowful search, it is said that <clears throat> Mary, upon encountering Christ, and he said, did, not you, did you not know that it had to be about my father's business? Mary did not understand these words, but Mary meditated upon these words in her Immaculate Heart. 
different nuances of that word to ponder, to meditate, to think seriously. And you might even think about the word ruminate. If you really go to the Greek, ruminate means what a cow does when he's chewing the cud. Cow has hay in his mouth. He's chewing and chewing and chewing and masticating and pulverizing before he swallows it to digest it. In certain sense, we're called to ruminate, ponder, like that beast of burden. So I hope that all of you have a renewed love for the Word of God. It's a light for our steps. It's a light and a lamp for us, as the psalm points out. So now, we're going to moving, move into the gospel, a very rich gospel. In a certain sense, you, make, you can make a parallel between a parallel between St. Anthony of the Desert and the Gospel today. Because St. Anthony of the Desert accepts what is called a vocation. A vocation means a call. He was called to leave everything so that he could pursue God in the silence of the desert. <clears throat> You're going to see now the parallel between that and the gospel today. There's a real parallel. So the gospel today is, we're in St. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, about five, five six verses. Yesterday we saw Jesus healing the paralytic. As Scott Hahn pointed out in one of his talks, the Gospel of Mark does not have a lot of parables. But a lot of short stories, it moves very quickly, and a lot of miracles. So Jesus heals the paralytic. So the gospel today, he presents Jesus walking along the sea. We've seen Jesus do this before when he chooses James, John, Peter, and Andrew, or fishermen on Lake Galilee, sometimes known as Tiberias. So he's walking along the seashore, and Jesus is like a magnet. He's attracting a lot of people. He's like a magnet, attracting a lot of people to himself. We should pray that we'd be like magnets. They're not attracting people so much to ourselves, but attracting people to Christ. Like John the Baptist. John the Baptist pointed to Christ. Like John the Baptist. Like John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. Part of living out our confirmation is trying to bring people closer to Christ. To be a signpost, which we're pointing to Christ, not to ourselves. Not meology, but theology. Not egotism, but a Christ Christocentric life. So, the crowds are following Jesus. 
The crowds are following Jesus. And he teaches them. See, Jesus is constantly teaching, preaching the word of God. In season and out, outside of season. He's constantly preaching and teaching. In a certain sense, we come together in, in which I'm preaching and teaching you so that you can preach and teach to others. <clears throat> Never forget, as John Paul II and Pope Francis points out, one of the best ways for us to grow in our faith is to teach our, is to share our faith with others. That's so true. I repeat, one of the best ways for us to grow in our faith, to grow in our own faith, is to share our faith with others. Which I'm doing right now. And hopefully you'll be able to share this. Share this. Not only invite you to be a fan, but try to share our talk. Try to share our conversation with some of your friends. We want to we want even grow in in holiness, but also in a number in our perseverance family. So this is the key element of the gospel today. Jesus is walking by the seaside. He's surrounded by a crowd. He's preaching. And as he passes by, he catches sight of a man. And this man, his name was Levi, son of Alphaeus. We know him to be Matthew. See, Levi, the son of Alphys, he's also known to be Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew, where was he? He was at his custom post. Now, what was Matthew doing? Matthew was a, he was a tax collector. Now, for the Jews... They despise the tax collectors. And for several reasons. Number one is that these tax collectors would be levying taxes on them, money, taking money from them, and this would be given to the Roman government. And the Jews despised the, the Romans because they were subjugated, subjugated, and they were subservient to the Romans. They were expecting that the Messiah would free them from the being subjugated and dominated, subservient to the Romans. And not only that, but many of the publicans were dishonest. They would be levying a tax, which was not very clear. They would jack up the price. So in a certain sense, what they were doing is they were stealing. Jacking up the price, they were stealing. We have Matthew, who was a tax collector. Also Zacchaeus, we meet in the Gospel of Luke, was also a tax collector. Zacchaeus was despised. We don't see Matthew being despised, but he was a he was a tax collector. So he's sitting at his customs post. Jesus sees him. And Jesus approaches Matthew. Now, earlier in our conversation, we were talking about the power of the Word of God. 
the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword. <clears throat> That's uh, from Hebrews 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's see this put into practice now with Jesus, who is the Logos. He is actually the word of the Father. See how powerful the word of God is if we allow the word of God to enter into us. But don't forget that we're free. We have the parable of the sower where the sower throws the seed on the footpath. The birds come and eat it up. On the rocks, it cannot dig deep into the rocks because it can't penetrate the rock. And in the thorns in which the word is, is suffocated by the thorns. Then the word falls on good ground and produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. Thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And that terrain is us. We can have a rocky soil, thorny, a footpath, or we can have a fertile ground in which the word of God falls and produces thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. But Jesus Jesus looks at Matthew and he says simply two words. Simply two words. But you're going to see how powerful the Word of God is. Like the living and effective sharp sharper than a two-edged sword it cuts right through matthew and any resistance that he might have had he says two words what are those two words those two words are follow me <clears throat> follow me Very interesting. Very interesting. Two words, two words, follow, two words, follow me, two words. How powerful the word of God is, but how powerful the word of God is when it, when it's said by Jesus himself, who is the Logos, he's actually the word of God himself. But still, we can resist. It says that Matthew followed him. Matthew followed him. But there's another passage where Jesus looks at a rich young man. And one of the evangelists says, Jesus looked at him with love. And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell all you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. Now, Paul the hermit followed Jesus. Anthony followed Jesus. St. Alphonsus followed Jesus. Matthew followed Jesus. The rich young man did not follow Jesus. It's the mystery of, of human freedom. I mean, right now, in a very special way, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and inviting you to follow him. Remember Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens up, I will come in and sit down to dine with you and you will dine with me. Revelation chapter 3. 
Jesus knocking at the door. The knocking at the door means he's knocking at the door of your heart. But Jesus respects our freedom. He's not going to force himself upon us. He respects our freedom. He respects our freedom. <clears throat> Very interesting artistic note on this passage is the following. One of the most well-known Italian artists, his name is Caravaggio. Caravaggio. And Caravaggio actually has this scene. We have this painting. Not in in one of the rooms in our in our rectory and it's a painting that makes me smile i think you'll like it too because he paints it as matthew seems to be in a room he's surrounded by people there's a table there's a small, small man that is looking at these coins on the table. His eyes are riveted. And that was not Matthew. And there in the background, you see a tall, slender man, and it's Jesus. And he's looking very intently at one of the men in the group. And Jesus is pointing to that man. The man that he's pointing to is the man of the gospel today. That man happens to be St. Matthew. He's pointing to him. And when Matthew is pointing back to himself, and what Matthew is really saying is this, by pointing at himself, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? Are you pointing to the right person? Almost as if Matthew was going to look to the right. Are you really, are you, are you pointing to me? And Jesus was pointing to Matthew. And he simply says, follow me. Follow me. Only two words. Matthew looks at Jesus. He, he listens to Jesus. He understands what Jesus is saying. Follow me. All the implications later on in life, of course not. And then Matthew gets up. And he leaves everything to follow Christ. And this decision will radically change the life of Matthew as well as the whole world. He will never, he will never again be the same. So my friends, in honor of St. Anthony, St. Paul, St. Alphonsus, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Jesus is saying to you right now. Right now, he's saying, follow me. Let us pray to the Blessed Mother and the Saints that we will have the courage to follow Christ, and this will be the best decision in our lives. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.